Good afternoon again. Thank you everyone for coming. I am Sebastian Burka, the Director of Corporate Programs at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed your lunch and thank you again for joining us. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome the Ambassador of Argentina to the United States, His Excellency Martin Lusto, to our platform today. And I would like to thank the uh, Argentine Consulate in Chicago and especially Consul General Berardi for their collaboration on this event. Today's program is the first in our new series on growth markets, which highlights um, investment opportunities across the world. And Argentina is a very good example of that. It is also a part of uh, the larger body of work that we do on global cities at the Council. And by the way, please mark your calendars for next June 7th through 9th, when we will host again the Chicago Forum on Global Cities. For nearly a century, the, the Council has provided an independent, nonpartisan platform for a variety of different voices to promote deeper global engagement and an active U.S. engagement in the world. We convene leading global voices, conduct independent research, and engage the public in the discourse on critical global issues. Views expressed by individuals we host are their own and do not represent institutional positions of or views of the Council. Our fall season is in full swing, and we have several programs coming up. Um, tomorrow afternoon, uh, NATO's former Deputy Supreme Allied Commander for Europe, uh, Sir Richard Shiraf, will analyze the implication of a resurgence in Russia for security, especially. Tomorrow night, we will welcome a high-level panel on the future of North Korea. And on October 24th, we will host a half-day symposium on the rise of populism around the world. Very important topic these days. Before we begin, please note that this event is on the record, so feel free to use social media. We are live streaming as well, but please remember to silence your phones. I will return to the stage to moderate the Q&A. And back to this afternoon's topic, I look forward to the insights uh, from Ambassador Lusto on the domestic reforms and the path ahead for international investments in Argentina following the election of President Mauricio Macri. And before we begin, I'd like to highlight a few of the ambassador's achievements. Um, he previously held ministerial and parliamentary roles in Argentina at both state level and for Buenos Aires. Prior to that, he was a partner and CEO of LCG, a consulting firm specializing in macroeconomics. He was also a chairman of Banco de la Provincia de Buenos Aires and Grupo BAPRO, a columnist for La Nación, and he is also a prolific writer. He has already written four books. So we look forward to the ambassador's remarks. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ambassador Martin Lusto. Thank you, Sebastian. And good evening, good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here sharing with you this lunch, and I would like to thank the Chicago Council on Global Affairs for hosting this event, and also the work of the staff at the Consulate General. Um, I'm, I want to convey what's happening in Argentina uh, at the moment, and in order to try to do that properly, I need to explain a, li a little bit of what has been happening recently in Argentina. Sebastian mentioned uh, populism and the rise of populism everywhere in the world. And in the last, in the 12 years before the current administration, actually we had a, a three administrations that could be described as populism. And I have my own definition of what populism is. Um, I think that populism is the permanent subordination of the long term to the short term. There are many ways of defining this from the academic point of view. But whenever you're favoring the short term over the long term, and whenever by, do, whenever, whenever by doing so you endanger the long term, then you can, you can be sure that you're, in front, you're confronting a populist government. And this is what's been happening in Argentina for quite some time. That's the reason why so many macroeconomic inconsistencies accumulated. But it's very important to understand why populism arises. Sometimes, uh, and I've been in dinners with President Macri where US leaders ask, how did you defeat populism? 
And it's easy to defeat populism when populism is fading down because it exhausted all the resources that it had to create this inconsistency and for favoring the short term. It's not so easy to fight when populism is arising because the populist speech, the way that it appeals to society is much more direct and simpler than what reality is always, always is. And in Argentina, the, what gave, what paved the way for populism, I think uh, we, can, we can trace that to several things. The first one is that we need to remember that Argentina from October 1998 until May 2002 endured what could be described as a Great Depression. We abandoned a monetary system in the same way that uh, that was uh, the case in, in the US in the 30s. All contracts were breached. Um, poverty level rose to over half of the population. Unemployment reached 24%. And we experienced a drop in GDP that was 20% cumulative drop in GDP that was 20%. So the starting point for someone to step in and profit from the rebound that was about to take place was very, very important. And on top of that, when the rebound started and demands on the state were very low because expectations were very low, and when the economy started growing at what could be described as, at, uh, as a Chinese, at, as a Chinese pace, revenues for the state uh, started increasing very rapidly. That meant that the government, the federal government in Argentina had plenty of resources. And when it was using that at the beginning, while it was using it in a very austere way, but increasing uh, benefits for the population at large, then came the booming commodity prices. And then you had a huge windfall of money. And that was spent very unwisely. And when you have that, when you have a populist government that it's uh, in its peak in terms of the resources it has, it's almost impossible to defeat it. Actually, if we take a look at the elections before the last presidential elections, the, elections, the presidential elections of 2011, uh, President Cristina Fernández de Kirchner won by obtaining 54%. The, next, the, the contender that followed that only got 17%. And for the system to behave um, virtuously, you need to have a strong opposition. And when you don't have this kind of opposition, many things happen. First, when the difference between the one that won a presidential election and the one who lost the presidential election is so big, then, for example, there, there is not even the chance of having criticism from inside the government. Why? Because you know, I want, when you win 51 to 49 and you make a mistake, people within your own camp would say, you know, we better take a look at this because if we make a mistake, then we'll, we'll lose. But if you win by such a wide margin, there is no difference of, of opinion inside the winning camp. Then the same happens with businessmen. If uh, someone's got the majority in both chambers, if that same person uh, is the head of the executive branch, and then if um, there is a decision that is being made that it's wrong, why on earth, if you're a businessman and you're concerned, would you go to speak to the opposition? The opposition is impotent. So what you do is you go and you just talk to the executive branch, and actually in order to be favored by the decision, you tell the executive branch exactly what they want to hear, whether it's true or it's not. And the next step to that is that since the opposition is impotent and businessmen and different um, um, establishments, organizations are impossible, are, are, cannot convey a proper message to the executive branch, then the only places in which you see that is the media. And then you've got a fight between the executive branch and the media because the executive branch never gets a, a story of what's happening actually and then they see a different story of what, they hear, of what they hear reflected in the media. And this is what happened in Argentina for quite some time. Actually, the inconsistencies, the macro inconsistencies of, of Argentina were so big that Argentina was heading towards a crisis, and we were lucky enough to have a very timely election. So the election came out about the right time in order to prevent Argentina from stepping into another crisis. 
and crises are extremely costly because there are massive redistributions of wealth from one group to another group. And avoiding crisis is extremely important. But it's also the case that whenever you are confronted with the consequences of your own decisions, and if those decisions led to a crisis, those are big consequences, that provides ample room for doing reform. If that's not the case, you have to be very, you have to show dexterity at introducing reforms while people were not confronted what was about to happen. And the inheritance in Argentina was extremely difficult. I, I usually describe it as a kind of a Bermuda Triangle. Uh, on one of the vertices, what we had uh, is a misalignment of relative prices. So we have a dual exchange rate. We had a formal and an informal or illegal exchange rate. We had uh, tariffs that uh, in a context in which, in, in which inflation was an average of 20% for 12 years, tariffs were frozen, so the cost of uh, uh, providing uh, utilities, uh, particularly um, um, energy in the form of gas or electricity, uh, um, the cost of, pro of providing these utilities was covered only, 20% of that was covered with tariffs. So that's a huge misalignment of relative prices, uh, a basic input for every production um, um, uh, activity that you, that, that you need to carry out. That was one of the vertices. So you had relative prices misalignment in a context of, of a very rapid inflation. The second vertex was that Argentina had a fiscal deficit of five percentage points of GDP. And the third one is that the economy was in stagflation, was, had not been growing for five consecutive years. So we were not creating private jobs. And the current administration needed to solve this uh, very difficult situation in which whatever you touch first will affect the other two vertices. And on top of that, there were some pending issues that were preventing business as usual in Argentina. You know the most famous one, which is the holdouts dispute, uh, that uh, the markets projected that that was going to be sold by year end, and it was sold early um, this uh, spring. Um, the same uh, happened with the unification of the exchange rate. That implies a, implied a devaluation, but the unification of the exchange rate was carried out the very first week President Macri was in power. Recently, we saw we, back, we moved back and forth with this, but we saw an increase in tariffs as well. Um, we saw the opening up of the not only the, of the economy, but we saw the opening up of the country in order to have a different relationship with the rest of the world. We were um, very lucky and honored by the pre visit of President Obama uh, early uh, in late March this year, before President Obama was there. Renzi was there, and President Hollande was there. Uh, so that implied that Argentina was opening up to the world and engaging in a, a mature relationship with all the countries. And many of the obstacles for doing business, business in Argentina were removed. So profit remittances from US companies abroad um, uh, were not allowed in the last years, and that was very rapidly solved. Uh, and the same for uh, importing. There were some obstacles to trade that were uh, very rapidly uh, uh, done, uh, uh, done away with. Why is this so important? Because uh, Argentina has a tradition of being an open country to the world. As a matter of fact, many of, of you may not know, but the, lar the largest source of FDI in my country is the US. And that has been the case since the end of the First World War with only one exception, which was the 90s, in which in the privatization scheme, uh, the US companies almost did not participate, and it was mainly done by French and particularly Spaniards. But other than that, the US has always been present in Argentina. Uh, actually, Argentina has uh, around 500 multinationals present, present in the country, and over 40% of them are US. And they do extremely complex things in Argentina, very complex things. Some companies, for example, they base their world R&D in Argentina. 
You, you, you can name a sector and name a U.S. company that does very, very sophisticated stuff in my country. And actually, that is what Argentina is about. We hate it when you, we, made, uh, we made it to the news because we were having conflicts or, 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 or there were bad news. Because our, and I would, I would add that I don't particularly like it when we make the news or we convey a message in, we, in which we talk about whether our Malbec is good or whether our beef is the best in the world or whether our soccer is the best in the world but will always come second. <laughs> or whether the Pope is Argentinian, or whether you have tango, or whether Borges was the greatest uh, uh, Spanish writer of the 20th century. I think that there, there's a whole other story about what the Argentinian society is about. And what is Argentina about? Argentina is about a very educated population. Actually, the father of our educational system um, it's a former president that before com becoming president, he was ambassador to the U.S. He came here to get inspiration on the uh, U.S. educational system. He became a very good friend of the Oransman family. He actually took teachers, U.S. teachers, to Argentina to start our educational system. Argentina was a, a country in the whole Latin America that uh, almost achieved a 100% liter literacy rate when all the rest were still or are still having trouble with that. Argentina is a country with a very deep uh, industrial history, a very resilient, actually, industrial history. Uh, it's a country that, um, again, produces very sophisticated things. We produce satellites. We export nuclear technology to the rest of the world. We are the only country in Latin America that has Nobel Prizes in Sciences. I know that I'm here in Chicago, and I know that only the University of Chicago by itself has 80-plus Nobel Prizes. But we have five Nobel Prizes. Three of them are in Sciences, and in Sciences related to health. That's Nobel, Prize, Nobel Prizes in Medicine and, and Chemistry. We have a very active base of entrepreneurship. Uh, it's the only country in Latin America that appears in, the, in all the surveys in terms of the quality of its entrepreneurship. Actually, of the five unicorns, that is, companies that were recently born and are worth over one billion now, of the five unicorns that uh, came from Latin America in the last decade, four of them were um, funded, uh, founded by Argentinians. And we have a very... We have a... Um, great uh, science tissue, even, even if that science tissue is some, sometimes abroad. Uh, Argentina has been repatriating lots of its scientists, many of them, but the other day I, I met here with, I think that we were maybe 30 um, of top scientists that are here present in the U.S., particularly in this area, um, physics that uh, uh, physics or physics, physics that work at the at Fermilab or Argonne, they teach at the University of Chicago or Northwestern uh, or Urbana Champaign. So uh, there is a vast vastness and a vast richness of what Argentina can provide to the rest of the world, and I think that's particularly true in the relationship with the U.S. We were, even though some in the recent years some some um, things drove us apart. I think that those things we can safely say that are over now. But we are two societies that have lots of things in common. First, um, we are two societies that were born out of immigration. And I know that the U.S. is a country that prides itself on immigration, but in percentage terms of its original population, Argentina has more immigration than the U.S. In the early 1920s, one out of every two people in Buenos Aires was foreign-born. And our institutions, for example, the inspiration for our constitution, or many of the laws that we have, are based on the spirit of the U.S. founding fathers. The history of our independence looks alike. 
actually San Martin and Washington, our two national heroes, they share lots of common characteristics. And I would say that if Argentina is this, Buenos Aires, which is my city, is kind of, uh, I don't know if you've read the, one of Borges, Borges' most famous story. Borges never wrote a novel. He, also, he wrote all genres of, of literature, but novels. And he said that he never wrote, wrote a novel because the length of the genre um, impedes or the, 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 gen, the length of the genre um, uh, it's, um, goes against perfection. So you can achieve perfection in short things, but it's very hard to achieve perfection in a novel. He wrote this very short story, or this short story, in which the name of the story is El Aleph. And there is this um, object that condenses in itself, in a tiny space, everything that the world has, everything that the universe has. And I would say that Buenos Aires is um, this history that I told you about Argentina concentrated in one space. Sometimes because uh, it's the center of Argentina, even though it doesn't reflect some other of the things that go around in more, more remote provinces, but it's the center of everything that happens in Argentina. It's the center of the news in Argentina. It shares with the national, with the federal government, the same news system, so the national TV and the national newspapers. So if you're in Buenos Aires, you learn almost everything that happens in our country. I, if I had to choose a city that we would partner or, um, um, or had a sibling sitting with the US, I would say that Chicago is that city. Because, first, because our sizes are similar. Uh, even though Buenos Aires may be 10 or 15 percent bigger than, than Chicago. Then because apart from this, uh, the city itself, the suburbs are um, even a challenging suburbs. Third, because after that, we're surrounded by farming and the most efficient farming in the world because of the soil and because of the technology. Also because um, Buenos Aires is the greatest education center in Argentina and has the biggest university in Argentina. Then we share some challenges that are related to, you have a lake, we have something that is between a mighty river and an ocean mixed together, which is the Rio de la Plata. And then we have a river itself that is challenging in terms of uh, the environmental sustainability with the Riachuelo. And I think I, I'm totally convinced that the U.S. and Argentina share lots of uh, characteristics. There's, there are lots of synergies to look for. Uh, there is a common history. There are common values that distinguish us from the rest of the world. And as I mentioned before, there is a very, ditch, a very rich history of U.S. presence in Argentina. And I would add that on top of the similarities of our two countries, we have this uh, very striking similarity between Buenos Aires and Chicago. So I think that there are plenty of opportunities for both sides to explore. And uh, these opportunities can lead us, both sides, to uh, enrich ourselves. We can learn from the other, and we can become greater by joining the other. So for all of you that have not been in Argentina, for all of you that have not been in Buenos Aires, I urge you to come to our fantastic country to enjoy, again, not only the tango, not only the Malbec, not only the beef, but the, all the rest, everything that Argentina and Buenos Aires can offer you, particularly given how close we are to each other. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, we will take some questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and wait for the microphone. I will call on you. And please make sure the question is a question and not a comment. Unless it's a very clever comment. <laughs> unless, unless that's true, yes. We have one here, please. 
I like your definition of uh, populism. Um, the question that occurs to me is, in terms of then recovering from some of the effects of populism, sometimes one has to get the inverse. So you have some short-term pain for long-term benefit. How do you see societies and political systems way to manage that difficult time? That's a very interesting question. I, I think that uh, the most enduring danger and, and consequence of populism is not whether you have a, a populist leader. Because once you have a populist leader, what you create is a populist culture. So it's very easy to get rid of a leader once that they exhausted all the resources that they had, all the future resources that they had to sustain the short term. That happens everywhere. Uh, you, we can see it now in Venezuela as well. The problem is what happens to culture. And um, the first thing I would say that is that that's why I mentioned whether you're experiencing a crisis or not, because that creates, that, that gives you very vividly the experience that it was not sustainable and that you need to refocus on the long term. And in order to have a better long term, you need to endure some short term pain. Um, that provides more support for things. I, even though Argentina didn't reach that, that uh, stance, um, even though President Macri was faced with very tough decisions, because as I mentioned, in here times was very difficult, his approval ratings is, below, is above uh, 50%. And that, that I'm talking about a country that had to devalue and had to increase tariffs. Both things affect consumption. Uh, that was experiencing a recession. So I think that there is a, a, some of the consequences of populists were, even though they were not so evident because we're not in a crisis, were close to, evidence, to evident. Then the most important or the key thing for me is how you work from then onwards. Why do I say this? Because all this discussion over the short term, they made you move away from the focus of what are your main challenges. And that's where um, defeating for good populism is so difficult. Because the, the messages for building a good long term or a good medium term are much more difficult to convey to the wide audiences than the easy speech of populists. Reality is complex. And you need to be able to, com to convey complex things in easy ways. Why? Because the media change a lot as well. Maybe the US is the only exception in the world, but in the 60s, you couldn't find a single country in the world where the media were private. The media were state-owned. Uh, they were not as massive as now. They were not so capillar as now. They wouldn't intrude in every single moment of your life. And now, the media has a, has a different um, logic to it. So it's, it's, not whether, uh, it, it's not whether the news are important for the long term or the news are structural. It's, it's whether they have rating or not. They are viewed or not. They are read or not. So that, that creates a short-term agenda in which easy messages are much more appealing than more complex messages. And that requires everyone who works for the long term to create, uh, if you want, uh, to step aside for a while and say, okay, this is the, we've been working on this, this is the things that we need to do, but then how we get a mandate for this, how we convince people for this. So I think that communicating is a great part of the story. We have one in the back. Hi. Esther Quintero de Paul University. Uh, Argentina is very well known in terms of people mobility for having one of the most important high skilled diaspora. Uh, besides this initiative of repatriate some of your talent, what are other initiatives that the Argentinian government is doing to capitalize this Argentinian talent abroad in favor of your country? Okay. Uh, it's, uh, it's true what you say, even though some of the, it's, it's a particular diaspora, because 
uh, they don't identify themselves as Argentinians. Maybe because immigrants, they blend it so well in Argentina that they don't identify themselves. You know, for example, I'm of, my family is of French origin, but I don't speak French. I almost, I learned where we came from maybe two years ago. I didn't, I, I never, I, I, Argentinians don't mind about that because they are Argentinians after a generation. They are Argentinians. So Argentinians, when they go abroad, even though every community that leaves its own place misses some things, and we are warm people, so we miss our friends, and we miss our families, and we miss our barbecues, but we blend in. Uh, so sometimes it's difficult to identify this diaspora. As you mentioned, it's a very skilled diaspora. And sometimes when I meet with this diaspora, some people say, I want to go back because I want to be part of what's being built in Argentina. I, maybe because I'm an economist, so I don't think well. But I always think that the, the best thing that you can do for your country is take a look at what are your relative skills. Sometimes where countries are in a crisis, you know, a, a top scientist says, I want to become a congressman because I want to help from there. And this is a, this is a terrible mistake. The best way to help your country is to do what you do for the country in relative terms better than all the rest. And sometimes that means being in a community abroad, working from abroad, but identifying yourself as Argentina in order to have a more dense network that connects um, what you're doing here with what's happening in Argentina. I think that's very important because of the following. There are, two, there are two ways of looking at being an, uh, a developing country. One is, you know, there is so much to do and our per capita GDP is lower than the rest of the, or, or, than the industrialized countries. But then the other thing is that you have the whole world as a mega lab for the things that worked and didn't work in order to solve the problems that you have and the challenges that you have. And it's very important that you have, if you want, many ties in different places in order to understand what works and what doesn't, and what avenues you should pursue and what avenues you shouldn't walk into. And I think that it's very important to interconnect our, our all the Argentinians abroad. And not only all, all, all the Argentinians abroad, but there are many foreigners that they really love the country. Because they, uh, I, don't know any, I don't know any foreigner that has been in Argentina that doesn't fall in love with the country. And maybe they did their businesses, and in difficult times, it was difficult. But they all enjoy Buenos Aires, they all enjoy Argentina. So I found, uh, everywhere I go, I find people that they are thinking about what else can be done uh, in relationship with Argentina. Hello, Ambassador. Thank you for coming to Chicago. And my name is Demet Matero, and I lived and worked in Argentina th throughout the 90s, and I fell in love with the place as well. My question is if you can share with us uh, maybe some more insights on the economic outlook uh, of Argentina, maybe more specifically the export economy, commodities, et cetera, et cetera, and um, you know, with the uh, reforms in tariffs and uh, you know, some positive things that are going on, you know, you know, what, are, what are some you know, maybe key indicators or, or uh, tidbits of uh, you know, information that are, 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 are looking promising. Okay, um, I would start with a broader macro picture. So I, I told you what the inheritance was, and if you need to realign exchange uh, relative prices again, what you saw is a surge in inflation, and uh, with that surge in inflation, what you had is an impact on consumption. In order to bring down inflation, you need to increase interest rates. So. Uh, the first measures, or the measures of the first 10 months, were very unpopular. That's why I keep saying that not only people, they maintain their support for the president, but also this is a government that doesn't, it would be a gross underestimation to say that it doesn't have a majority in Congress. It has a, a bit over a third of congressmen and a bit less than a fourth of the Senate. And even though that was the case, many of the most difficult bills were passed by over, in some cases, over 60% of the representatives and the senators. So um, uh, what happened in the first half of the year is that we saw inflation spiking. 
and economic activity going down. And what we're seeing now is that inflation is really tamed. So it's converging to next year targets. And we see uh, already, we, we already saw the uh, economy bottoming and starting to rebound. So after these difficult missions in which, again, the people uh, maintain their support for the president, I think that what we're looking for next year is an economy in which inflation is converging sometimes uh, more rapidly than some people thought, even though remember that we're coming for, for, from a level of 40% inflation year, uh, yearly inflation, and where the economy is starting to rebound. Then in specific sectors, that is much more visible because the, uh, the change of rules in terms of tariffs for exporting and in, in, agriculture, in the agricultural business uh, imply that the agriculture in, agriculture in Argentina is again enjoying kind of a boom. Um, and the, the challenge that Argentina has in the, sh in the long term regarding uh, exports is you know, it's to move away from the commodity, even though we know that commodities nowadays have a lot of technology in the commodity itself, in the seed. But um, it's to add value to that. And the reason why um, in the past this was not the case, or this was not broadly the case, it's because in order to export added value products, industrialized products, that takes time and it takes capital. And there is a Nobel Prize in economics since John Hicks that used to say that um, to invest, to do long-term invest, investing is like giving away hostage. Because, you know, so you, have a, you are a hostage to someone. You become a hostage. So, the, the thing that you need to add value are to, first you need stability, and the second thing is you need to decrease the cost of capital. It's very easy to export a commodity. It's very easy to export soy, for example, soybeans. But it's not that easy to put the soybeans and the maize and um, produce um, um, uh, balan uh, alimento balanceado, how do you say that? Animal feed animal feed, and then with that to produce chickens, and then with the chickens produce what we have is a, a chicken Milanese, and package it out and put it in Tesco in London. It's not the same thing. And in order to be able to do that, you need commitment, you need time, and you need capital. And I think that the conditions in Argentina are Gear, to, gear in that direction in which the environment will be, it's already and will be much more uh, appealing towards those who want to add value and, um, and create um, not only uh, more uh, uh, labor posts, but also um, um, higher paid labor posts. Yes, um, given the recent uh, economic and political problems in Brazil, I'm curious to hear your comments on the current relationship between Argentina and Brazil and how its problems are affecting the Argentines. Okay. Uh, Brazil is our main trading partner. So we say that um, when Brazil uh, catches a cold, we sneeze. Actually, the impact in our GDP of the last year um, economic performance of Brazil, or lack of economic performance of Brazil, uh, amounts to almost uh, to roughly um, um, 1.5 percentage points of growth in Argentina. I think that we think that Brazil is uh, turning the corner, a difficult corner, but it's turning the corner. Uh, so that instead of subtracting growth to Argentina, next year will add some growth to Argentina. Then there is this issue about um, the common market or the customs union that Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, and Paraguay built together, and then Venezuela joined. And uh, that is a customs union that was very important in order to do away with some uh, a political um, suspicions 
and bad relationship that we had in the, during, during the military dictatorships. So it created a bet, much better a political environment, but it did not perform as a customs union well. There are many reasons to that. But I would say that the main reason, one is that it's customs union, so it has a common external tariff instead of being just a, a trade agreement. The second one is that both countries experienced lots of crises during, since the, the Mercosur was actually built. <coughs> These crises were so big that actually none of the two main partners of Mercosur, that is Brazil or Argentina, have, have the same currency denomination than when the Mercosur started. You know, the U.S. has always had the same currency denomination and actually the same bills. Argentina, when we entered Mercosur, our, our currency denomination was Austral, and now we have a peso. And Brazil entered Mercosur uh, with um, cruzados, and now they have reais. The fact that both countries needed to change the currency denomination, I think it's a, a symbol of how deep the crisis were. It's very difficult to be the common, the common market uh, when you are uh, enduring that kind of instability in the main partners. Actually, what I think is happening is that the world is moving away from these mega blocks and uh, it's um, negotiation, negotiating trade deals in a much more bilateral, plurilateral fashion. And I think that those things were starting to see Mercosur, and actually that's the... the the lead that President Macri is having on how he views Argentina opening up to the world. So now Mercosur has um, um, uh, made public exchange offers with the European Union for a trade agreement. Now Argentina has become an observer in the Pacific Alliance. And now Argentina is exploring trade agreements with Canada, Korea, Japan. So um, it's not only that Brazil affects economic performance, but everything that happened within Mercosur is being rethought by the different uh, uh, players in Mercosur. Thanks for your presentation. Um, you were mentioning about the importance of long-term investments and how Argentina is getting back into the world. Um, here in Chicago, one of the major sources of capital investment is the transportation infrastructure. Um, I'm just wonder what's the Argentinian current administration vision and long-term plan for improving, you know, our transportation infrastructure. Okay, um, Argentina has put together already the most ambitious uh, transportation uh, plan that we've seen in quite some time. I would say at least in the last 50 years. And there are new tools being discussed in Congress that were not the taste of the previous administration, such as a private, public-private partnership in order to build that infrastructure. So Argentina needs to revamp its infrastructure. It used to have, Argentina used to have a, the best education system in the, in the whole Latin America, the best infrastructure system in the whole Latin America, and I would say best health system in the whole Latin America. Infrastructure, the, even the IT infrastructure up to the 90s Argentina entered this century with the best IT structure of the whole Latin America. And I think that we need to revamp these things. So we need, and this, in these areas, again, we welcome the competition by U.S. companies. We would love the U.S. companies to enter um, as uh, potential competitors in the bidding processes for infrastructure. We need uh, investment in energy. We have an energy deficit in a country that has nuclear technology, an oil and gas industry that spans over 100 years, the second largest shale reserve, gas shale, uh, shale gas reserve in the world, and the fourth largest oil, shale oil reserve in the world. We have um, the second world best conditions for solar and wind energy. So there's a whole chapter of infrastructure in terms of energy, where we think that there are lots of synergies between the U.S. and Argentina. The reason being that the matrix that the U.S. developed in the last two decades is the same kind of matrix that Argentina needs. That's oil, gas, plus renewables. 
we need to revamp and extend our rail railroad system. Um, our rail railroad system at one, at one point in time had over 40,000 kilometers in length. And now it's maybe seven or 8,000. Um, the, uh, Buenos Aires had the second uh, metro system after New York in the whole Americas. And now Santiago de Chile has a metro system that's much more extended than Buenos Aires. We need uh, investment in logistics, airports, ports. We need investment in uh, our water highway. There is a, a hydrovia is a place where it's the easiest way to uh, for all the um, the farming production to get out of the different parts of the country, you know, or come to from different parts of the country in order to get out of Argentina. So I think that um, the U.S. experience in these things and the, and the quality of the U.S. companies in each of the sector, in, in each of these sectors, make a strong case for U.S. companies to participate in what's happening in Argentina. Thank you, Ambassador. That's all the time we have, unfortunately. Please join me in thanking the Ambassador. Thank you.